I want to do a part three of this uh, document, Trapped in a Black Box, Growing Terrorism Watch Listing in Everyday Policing. Uh, this is put out by the ACLU, and I'm going to begin with a video here. So... The watch list, also known as the Terrorist Screening Database, is used by U.S. intelligence agencies to nominate people as known or suspected terrorists. Over the past 15 years, the list has grown from a few thousand to more than one million names. But the most troubling fact is that leaked documents revealed that 40% of the names on the list had no established ties to recognized terrorist organizations. So why are these people on the list? Okay, that is the question that I want to answer here as we go through this document. Uh, this is the document put out by the ACLU. Looking at paragraph four here, encounters with law enforcement. It says the documents obtained through FOIA litigation, along with other publicly available documents, show the following about law enforcement officers' encounters with watch list individuals. Now, keep in mind, this has to do with the encounters, and I took the word watch out, and I put targeted targeted individuals, because I do believe that these are represent the encounters with targeted individuals. All right, it goes on to read there, when local law enforcement encountered an individual on the KST, such as a routine traffic stop, and the officer runs a search of the individual's name in the NCIC. Now, keep in mind, the NCIC stands for the National Crime Information Center. So you're going to see a lot about the NCIC. And keep in mind that this is the national, representing the United States. This is not outside the United States. The NCIC represents the National Center of, or the National Crime Information Center. NCIC database, okay, the officer ordinarily receives an NCIC hit showing that the individual had been watch list as a terrorism suspect. In the overwhelming majority of cases, an officer who encountered a watch list individual was not encountering a person with an outstanding arrest warrant. Instead, the individual was on the list for tracking and information gathering purposes only. So keep in mind that these individuals are on the list, the ones that are coming up for under the NCIC hit. They're on the list for tracking and information gathering purposes only. Goes on to read, although the TSC issued some standard advis advisory message to law enforcement officers on how to conduct these encounters. The disclosure of individual individuals watch listing status to local law enforcement officers made the individuals vulnerable to intensified monitoring and investigating investigative interests. So these individuals that are coming up on this NCIC. Uh, this this hit, the notifications that come up for law enforcement. Uh, these individuals are suspect to, or they're vulnerable to intensified monitoring and investigative interests, all right? These are people who are uh, non-investigative individuals. We're talking about the non-investigative subjects on the KST uh, file. It says between December 2003 and May 2007, individuals in over 40 percent of all encounters that were referred to the TSC call center were a false match or were actually on actually or were not actually on the watch list. So 40 percent of the individuals that were on the uh, between 2003 and 2007, 40 percent of the individuals that came up to the uh, TSC call center, they were actually not on the watch list, but they were being watched, 
All right. I want to go over the encountering process because I think this is important. It says when a local officer queries the NCIC, that's the National Crime Information Center, about an individual who is the subject of an entry in the KST file, the officer generally receives a message through the NCIC about the individual, right? And once he receives this message, he goes on to say entries in the KST are categorized by the type of message or handling code that the NCIC returns to the querying officer. As of 2009, uh, KST utilizes three separate handling codes described in detail below. Handling code number one for subjects with arrest warrants. Handling code number two for subjects who are slated to receive DHS detainers, and then handling code number three for all the rest. Now, I want to go over handling code number three. I'm going to kind of skip through it. If you want to look at handling code numbers one and two, I would invite you to go ahead and download the document and read it, read through it. It goes on to read there, the vast majority of the KST entries appear to have been handling code number three. Now, I want to emphasize that, uh, handling code number three. It says this is the catch-all category. Uh, so, handling code number three seems to be the predominant handling code when law enforcement meets or encounters someone on the watch list. And again, these are individuals who are local, national uh, entries. These are individuals who live in the United States of America. It says, as of March 2007, 96.8% of the VGTOF entries were handling code number three. 0.5% were handling code number two, which are detainers. And then 2.1% were handling code number one. Uh, they had arrest warrants. Uh, the remaining 0.6% of entries were others, presumably meaning silent hit entry. We'll go over the silent hit entries. It says, thus, it appears that the KST in practice has primarily identified and tracked the whereabouts of its subjects and very rarely has resulted in arrest or detention. For the vast majority of subjects, which fall under handling code number three. KST has acted as an information collecting tool for the TSC. So uh, the vast majority of the individuals who are on the KST file, they fall under handling code number three. And the vast majority of them have not been subject to arrest or detention. And the vast majority of them are individuals who Law enforcement or the or the, the F boys are just collecting information on. It says in 2006, uh, in a 2006 meeting of the NCIC Advisory Policy Board, the director of the TSC stated that the VGTOF's purpose is to ensure that for the very first time, state and local officers had some ability to know that someone they pulled over could be on the watch list, prompting the law enforcement, a law officer, local officer who encountered someone on the watch list to call the TSC and provide the TSC with additional information about the subject. The TSC's practice has been to record such information using a tool called the Encounter Management Application which was implemented in July 2004 and contains records of all encounters since the TSC became operational. Information gathered from the encounter is analyzed and used to enhance the existing watch list records, which the intelligent community uses as to assess threats and to conduct investigations. All right, continuing, I'm going to kind of skip down to the middle part of the paragraph there where it says for domestic encounters. For domestic encounters, the F-boys must be consulted prior to taking any action based on encounters with a person who is a positive match or with known or suspected terrorists. Uh, and, 
again, I want to encourage you to kind of look through this paragraph here. I want to kind of skip forward to look at the actual handling code number three. Uh, this is in the document where it talks about the handling code number three. It says, finally, handling code number three applies to all entries that are not categorized as handling codes one and two or silent hits. The text of the message for handling code three states, quote, now I want to kind of read through this kind of slowly here so that uh, we can understand what this represents. Keep in mind, handling code number three represents about 98% of the individuals on the KST file. Law enforcement sensitive information. Do not advise the individual that they may be on a terrorist watch list. Contact the Terrorist Screening Center at 866 during this encounter. If this would extend the scope or duration of the encounter, contact the TSC immediately thereafter. If you are a Border Patrol officer, immediately call the NTC. It goes on to read there, attempts to obtain sufficient identifying information during the encounter without otherwise extending the scope or duration of the encounter to assist the TSC in dis determining whether or not the name or the identifier you query belongs to an individual identified as has having possible ties with terrorism. Do not detain or arrest this individual unless there is evidence of a violation of federal, state, or local statutes. Unauthorized disclosure is prohibited. Information that this individual may be on a terror, terrorist watch list is property of the TSC and is a federal record provided for your agency that may not be disseminated or used in any proceeding without the advance authorization of the TSC. Now, it says at the bottom there, warning, approach with caution. Warning, approach with caution. You can see that this is very serious. Now, keep in mind, this represents 98% of the individuals who are encounter law enforcement who are on the KST file. All right, it says this message makes it clear that the querying officer should attempt to identify, but not to arrest or detain the individual. It, it also states that the officer may contact the TSC after letting the individual go to avoid extending the length of the encounter. I don't believe that this happens with every TI that's encounter encounters law enforcement. It says the three handling codes above were in operation as of 2009, but it is not clear if they continue to contain the language and the formal and the format listed above. In the past, some handling code messages contained a stronger warning against using the VGTOF hit as grounds for search and seizure. It says, warning, standing alone, NCIC, violent gang and terrorist organization. File information does not furnish grounds for the search and seizure of any individual, vehicle or dwelling. This warning appears to have been omitted from the most recent handling codes. The 2009 handling code lacked such specific in instructions for law enforcement to ensure that they do not use the KST hits improperly to extend the scope of detention. Now, it goes on to read here at the bottom of the page, the documents related to the encounters with watch, watch list people underscore that K KST functions primarily as a means of tracking and monitoring individuals. And, and again, I want to emphasize that, guys. I mean, what we're reading and what we're talking about is basically a way by which the F-boys can actually monitor and track individuals without them knowing, number one. And number two, under silent hits, they're able to track them without the law enforcement knowing it as well. It goes on to say it is not aimed only at a legitimate and targeted need to apprehend actual known terrorists. And it carries the significant risk that innocent people will be subject to intense scrutiny or lengthy intrusive stops by law enforcement officers. All right, I'm going to end there. Uh, at this time, I'm going to insert a video put out by National Geographic 
where the uh, journalist is discussing this process with the F boys. What exactly can the government do to him, to any of us, whether we're on the watch list or not? As a journalist, my first hunch is to go straight to the source. Michael German is a former FBI agent who has experience with the terrorism watch list. What is the internal designation given to people who are on that watch list? Known or suspected terrorist. Do you need to be a known or suspected terrorist to be given that designation? No, you do not. There's plenty of evidence that people were put on these lists were investigated for no reasons. So you're building this expanding pool of suspects based on little or no real evidence. What are the most extreme things that can happen to you if you end up in that system? There's so little transparency that we don't know all the ways that the watch list might be used. So from a deprivation of rights standpoint, there's a lot you could lose. So I think a lot of people are not aware of this. What you're saying then is that at least some of our constitutional protections don't exist when we're in a border crossing or an airport coming back from abroad. Right, you might try going to the airport tomorrow and seeing how you do. 